of baptism. <laughs> baptism is a very special time in the life of a believer. And we believe here from the scriptures that baptism, in regard to this water right here, the baptism does not save anyone. The waters in here do not save anyone. The only one who is able to save you and I is the living water, Jesus Christ himself. And so what we're going to be seeing today is a picture of what Jesus did for you and for me. We're going to see a physical picture of a spiritual truth. The one who has come today has said in his heart that he believes that Jesus died for him. That when Jesus went on the cross and took his sins, that everything he had ever done, past, present, and future, all sins that Donnie had committed against the Lord, were put onto Jesus, and Jesus took those sins on the cross and into the grave. So when you see him go under the water, that's what it's representing, a death to sin. That word baptized means immersed. It means completely submerged, immersed in it. So you baptize, you go completely under the water, saying, I am completely dead to sin. This is not who I am, this is no longer what I am. Just as Jesus took all of our sins onto himself on the cross. Then, as he comes out of the water, he is symbolizing how Jesus resurrected from the grave. And he conquered death, and he conquered sin, that anybody who believes in him can themselves be saved. In the same way, our brother this morning is going to come out of the water representing and showing the world that he is now born again, raised to walk in a new way of life by the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Amen. This is what we're going to be seeing today, and this is why Donnie has come. Brother Donnie, come on down. Tom does a good job. Dottie has a wonderful story. He was in this very church 20 to 25 years ago. He prayed and he accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. Brother Tom Stevens sat with him as he prayed this prayer, and he received it, he did accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. But at that point, he was not a disciple. He didn't get to walk along with anybody and learn what it means to follow Jesus. So God started drawing him in as of late, these last few months, God's been drawing him into the church, hearing the Word of God. He started coming on Tuesday night discipleship, and he came up, he said, Josh, I need to be baptized. Amen. Anytime somebody tells me that, I'm really careful because I don't do a double dunk. I don't believe in it. You get baptized once, once alone. It's enough. If you want to rededicate your life, that's great. But you don't need to be rebaptized. That's, that's not a thing. It's once enough. And he said, No, I've never been baptized. You know, God's done such an amazing work in Donnie's life. He's hungry for the Word of God. He's recognizing that his own way and his own path didn't lead to the right choices in the right areas. And he's seeing as God has been drawing him back in and that obedience is the one thing he desires for the Lord. And I praise the Lord for Donnie's faith. I praise the Lord for Donnie's willingness to step up and say, you know what, I've just come to the realization I didn't do what God told me to do. And he didn't want to wait two weeks. He didn't want to plan three months out. He's like, no, like, this Sunday. Let's get it done. He's going to have a study Bible. He's going to have all the tools he needs. A group of men who love him. A church who's going to be there for him. And he desires to be a member officially by baptism. Can I hear a motion? Amen. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. <laughs> he sat up there, get her done. <laughs> Is it true that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Is there anything you'd like to say?
And it's my privilege, my brother, to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death. Raised to walk on the of the life.
I pray that we will, we will stand firm on your word and we will continue to create disciples as you prepare the hearts and sow the seeds, God, that as people would come to know you, that we would be a church that sees the opportunity to take them in, to grow them up in you, Jesus, so that they can go out and share the gospel, that they can make more disciples. Father, prepare our hearts this morning for the word that will be presented through our worship songs, through uh, the choir songs, and through Pastor Josh's message. And again, I, I pray that we would leave here this morning a little changed and closer to you. We pray these things in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
wonderful truth that I was told as I was uh, receiving the call to preach was that you'll never outgrow the gospel. You'll never go deeper than the gospel. You'll never learn more than the gospel. And if the gospel is not enough for us at any given time, then we have lost sight of what the gospel means. It's not that God's messed up. It's that we have uh, felt that we've moved beyond it. And if we feel that we've moved beyond it, that's pride and we are beginning to sin. The cross is enough. The gospel message is enough. Uh, today's message is continuing the series called His Story. We're going to look at Jesus in every book of the Bible of the Old Testament. My daughter had a, uh, almost had a panic attack when she saw that the passage was going to be out of Genesis 37 to 45. And she said, are we going to read the whole book of Genesis? <laughs> I said, no, but the subtitle is Joseph, a colorful picture of Jesus. And we're going to see the parallels between Joseph's life and Jesus' life and see absolutely, without a doubt, Jesus was telling his gospel message through the life of Joseph. And we're going to be looking at particular passages uh, out of these various chapters and seeing uh, what God did and said. But I encourage you, after the fact, to go back and read all of the, these chapters in context and ask the Lord to reveal to you additional information about how Jesus is fulfilled in these passages. We're going to read out of Genesis 37 to begin, chapter 37, verses 18 to 24. And I do invite you to stand at the reading of God's Word, Genesis 37, verses 18 to 24. And as a reminder, we ask to stand at the reading of God's Word because we find this principle in the Old Testament that the congregation of Israel would stand at the reading of God's Word in reverence to recognizing this is a holy thing. So it's not just some tradition we made up. All right. Verse 18, now when they saw him afar off, this is Joseph's brothers, they see Joseph walking. Even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit, and we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him, that's Joseph, out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph <laughs> of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your marvelous ability to speak your story throughout the ages. Thank you for giving us a testimony in Scripture of what it was going to look like when you would personally come down and fulfill all things for our sake and for the sake of your great name. Our Heavenly Father, we ask for your discernment today, for your understanding. Help us to see and read and hear exactly who you are and what you did for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first section we're going to look at is rejected, and we're going to send, uh, spend a considerable part looking here in chapter 37, uh, beginning here in verse 2. But the first thing we see about Joseph, he was rejected. Chapter 37, verse 2, this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock of his, with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. So Jacob in the Bible is, uh, his name later becomes Israel, or Israel, and so this is, if you read it, the history of Israel. And part of the history of Israel is you have this young man named Joseph, and he is 17 years old. The first parallel that you're going to see here is that Joseph is a shepherd. 
He's feeding the flock. Jesus, of course, is the good shepherd. The other parallel we see here, though, is that Joseph comes to his father and he's bringing a bad report. For those of us who have had jobs where we get those reviews or those annual reviews and we sit down and, man, we do not want to get a bad report, right? We want them to say, oh, how wonderful and great we are. And when we hear those criticisms, they hurt. Well, what we know is that Jesus brought a bad report of Israel time and time again. We see this in Mark 8.38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, look at how he describes it, in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the Holy Angels. You know, when God gives a very honest and sincere report of where our heart is, it hurts. We hear God look at us and say, you know, you're being an adulterer right now. We say, how am I being an adulterer? He says, well, you're putting other things above me. You are supposed to be married to me as your Lord, your Savior. And yet your heart is far from me. And your heart is going towards other false gods and other idols. And he says, that is, in the worst sense, adultery. We hear that. We say, no, no, no. Give me the good report. Remind me of all the good things I've been doing. But God, he can and he does give a bad report. Joseph was going to his dad. He was giving a bad report of his brothers. His brothers were not doing what they were supposed to do. These are the tribes of Israel. He's coming to his father and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Jesus also, in his day and age, looked around. He said they're adulterous. They're sinful. Chapter 37, verse 4. He continues, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Joseph was loved and was shown special favor by his father. The parallel is that the Pharisees and scribes hated Jesus because Jesus had been shown special favor, clearly anointed by God on high, and they hated him for it. Matthew 13, 54 to 57. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue that they were, so they were astonished. And they said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? And they say, is this not the carpenter's son? Look at this change of heart immediately. First they're astonished, and man, this guy is coming with some amazing teachings. And they say, but wait, he's, he's just a, he's a carpenter's son. Is not his mother called Mary? Is Brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Look at that. So they were offended at him. It offended them that Jesus had special favor from God. We ought to be really careful about what we get offended at. When it comes to the things of the Lord. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. He will tell us things and He will reveal truth in our life. And He will call us out just as we are. And we ought to be real careful that we don't turn around and say, Well, that offends me, God. That hurts my heart. Verse 8, it says in thirty-seven, chapter 37, His brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. This is what happened. Uh, Joseph had the gifting of dreams and visions. And he had a couple of very significant dreams. And he sees first his brothers are bowing down to him. Worship almost. Then he has another vision where even his mom and dad, along with his brothers, are all bowing down to him. And he is raised and lifted up. And this bothered his brothers. When we see somebody else that God has anointed or, or put special favor on and God seems to be lifting them up and raising them up, we do tend to get very defensive. We do tend to say, ah, oh, no way. They're not having authority over me. They're not having power over me. And we say, no, no, no. But we need to be really careful because God could very well be doing the work in that person's life. And building them up and setting them up for a great ministry 
And we need to be very careful that we don't immediately just assume the worst. God could be building and growing, and it says they hated him over his words. The parallel is that Jesus had brothers. And we'll get to his like blood immediate family, but he had Israel. He had the Pharisees, the scribes, who hated him for his dreams, for his understanding, the gifting from God, and they hated Jesus for his words. Matthew 22, 15. The Pharisees went and plotted how they might, look at that, entangle him in his talk. They wanted Jesus to say something wrong, do something wrong. I, I know that I'm guilty of it. Have you ever had somebody that you're just waiting for them to fall and fail? You're, you're just waiting for them to say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, so you can like jump on them and pounce on them. Ha ha! I knew it! You knew what? They're a sinner too, just like us. They fail, they mess up too, just like I do, just like you do. Yeah, no kidding. We are all sinners saved by grace. Amen. Grace alone. So here they are. They're hating him and they're wanting to entangle him in his talk. Chapter 37, verses 18 to 20. Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said, look, the dreamer's coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him. Cast him into some pit. We shall say some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. The parallel here, very clearly, Jesus also was plotted against that he might be murdered as well. Matthew 26, 3-5. The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery, and to kill him. And they said, but not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. If you ever want to discern, if you ever want to know if an idea is from God or not, a very easy and simple way of evaluating is, first and foremost, is this idea able and willing to be broadcast in the light? Will I take whatever plan, whatever plot I'm actively involved in, and am I willing to stand in front of God's people and God himself and say, this is the plan. Are you willing to, to share and cast it to all the light that everybody may see it, know it, hear it, and understand it? If, if that's true, then you're probably on a good path. If you're willing to just share it with the world and say, yes, absolutely, I want everybody to know. But if you've got a plan or an idea, some sort of plot, something you're involved in, and you are thinking, how is this politically going to affect me? or affect others, you're already beginning to dig into darkness. Cover it up so that some people will know, other people won't know, but nobody really gets the full idea of it. When you're doing those things in your heart and in your mind, guess who sees all of it? The Lord Jesus Christ. These people were plotting to trick Jesus and kill him and they're like, but wait, the timing's not politically right right now, so we'll wait till it's going to be better later on. We ought to be real careful about what we're plotting in our hearts and in our minds. If we're not willing to broadcast it out the open for everyone to hear it, then we ought to stop and reconsider. Verses 23 to 24, so it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers, they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him, then they took him and cast him into a pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. The parallel, of course, is that Jesus was stripped and he was crucified, thrown into a grave. Matthew 27, 28, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. This is a robe of mockery. But he was stripped of his clothes. I've been stripped two times in my life. One time I was going to jail and they strip you of your clothes in jail. Second time I was going into boot camp and they strip you naked in boot camp. Neither time did I feel awesome. <laughs> it never feels good to be stripped and broadcast out naked. Our Lord and Savior was stripped and humiliated before he was crucified. Then they put this mockery of a robe on him, clothed him with their own mockery and saying, here, wear this, because we hate you. This is what our Lord did for us. This is what Jesus Christ did for you and for me. He knew he was about to go into it. He knew this is what he was headed toward, and he did it anyway. He did it willingly. 
Matthew 27, 31, when they mocked him, they took the robe off, and then they put his own clothes on him, and they led him away to be crucified. Beaten, bloody, unbelievable, horrendous pain. And they're ripping clothes off and putting them back on and putting thorns on his head. They just want him to feel terrible. We need to be extremely careful that we don't attempt to strip Jesus of his true power and his true position as Lord of our lives. You know, oftentimes we will love to say, yeah, Jesus is my Savior. Oh yeah, I follow Jesus. I'm a disciple of Jesus. But when it comes to our day-to-day -day living, right, the Monday through Saturday time frame, we want to strip Jesus of his robe. We want to strip Jesus of everything that he really is and say, okay, yeah, yeah, but just give me, like, the loving Jesus. Give me the Jesus who's going to tell me how great I am. I'm going to strip Jesus of who he really is as God and creator, and I'm going to make him something I want him to be Monday through Saturday. And then I'll come on Sunday, and he can be the God on high again, and I'll raise my hands, and I'll praise and worship him. My friends, Jesus is not one to be mocked. If he's calling you to do something and to be somebody, that's who you need to be, and that is what you need to do. Myself included, of course. We cannot run away and we cannot strip or attempt to strip God of his authority and think that we're doing something. We're simply lying to ourselves as those were here. The pit they throw him in, it says it was empty and it had no water. It had no water in the pit. When Joseph was thrown into that pit, it says there was no water there. Why do you think it says that? Because there was no expectation of life when he was thrown into that pit. Matthew 12, 40. Jesus said, As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. When Jesus died, he died completely. That's what that whole idea of when we talk about baptism. The word means immersed. Jesus did not have like one foot in the grave and one foot out. Like, I'm ready to get out. He wasn't partially or barely, mostly in the death. He was dead. He was totally dead. This was in the belly of the earth, in the tomb. He was sitting there, dead, absolutely dead. He did that for you and for me, that our sin would be dead. What sin in your life right now, you know right now between you and God, you feel like if this one sin was taken care of, you'd be so much better. Whatever that one sin is, ask yourself, is it dead to you or is it alive? Is it buried or is it alive? It's dead to Jesus. It's dead to him. So if it's still alive to you in some way, you're lying to yourself. And I'm lying to myself that in some way it's alive. Because it's dead to our Lord and Savior. It's dead. Amidst all this rejection and the plots of murder, Joseph remained faithful to God. Same as Jesus. We see this perhaps no more clearly demonstrated than in Genesis 39, verses 6 through 12. Now Joseph was a handsome in form and appearance. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes onto Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept anything back from me except you, but you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or be with her, but it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, none of the men in the house was inside. She caught him by the garment and said, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand, and he fled and ran outside. Now men, there's a lot of pornography on your phones, your tablets, your computers, and it's not grabbing you by any garment. It's not pulling you away. It's got no authority or control over you. And you are allowing it to wreck your mind and your sexual relationship with the one that God has chosen you to be with. This is not an impossible battle. 
Every man in here knows what it's like to be tempted in that way. And every one of us in here wants to look around and say, yeah, but everybody else is doing it. Here's one we can look to and say, he didn't. Joseph shows us the right heart, the right attitude. He went away. He says, does that mean I'm going to put my phone down and run away from my phone? If you need to, yeah. <coughs> Guess what it's not going to do? Grab your coat. <laughs> follow you along. My friends, my brothers, I'm telling you. We have the potential as God's people to be a light in this dark, dark world. And when you can give a testimony of being free from the power of pornography, you can be different and set apart. Or, you can go right along doing what you're doing, thinking Jesus is going to forgive you anyway and that he doesn't care, trying to strip him of his robe. Jesus was tempted when he was alone in the desert. When he was hungry, when he felt weak, Nobody was around. Nobody had to know. But he kept his character and he kept his righteousness before the Lord. You can read that in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. Verse 9, though, of this Genesis 39, it says, How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So this is where our heart needs to be. If you're a man or a woman, this is where our mind needs to be. Before we go and think about doing this sin that we're going to do, remember that we're not sinning against that person or against that thing. We're sinning against God. Joseph had a woman talking about him saying, lie with me, lie with me. He pushes her away and says, no, how can I do this wickedness against the Lord? How can I do that? Concluding point number one, he was rejected, but he remained faithful. Our Lord Jesus Christ was rejected, but he remained faithful. Section number two is he suffered. You can look at a few chapters here in Genesis 40. 42, but also 37. We see a backstory here, uh, verse 37, 28. Let's see, how did Joseph get into this house? How did he come here? It says, the, then the Midianite traders passed by, and so the brothers pulled Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, sold him to the Ishmaelite for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. He, Joseph suffered. One area we see here that he suffered, we know that Jesus was also sold for 30 pieces of silver. That's the parallel. He was sold out by his own brothers. Here's some silver. It's worth the cost and price of my own bride. Matthew 26, 14 to 15, one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? They counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. We're reminded that Judas' name is Judah, as in the tribe of Judah. <coughs> Israel sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And as I've said before, I believe many times I, in my own life, I've sold him out for less. Backstory 2 is chapter 39, verses 19 to 20. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner that his anger was aroused. And then Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison place where the king's prisoners were confined and he was there in prison. So here's Joseph. He's put into this pit because his brothers hate him for who he is. Then they bring him out. They sell him out to a foreign people and sell him out for some pieces of silver. He goes into this master's home. He does right by the master. He does what he's supposed to. And then his master's wife falsely accuses him of things he did not do. And then he's thrown into prison. The parallel is Jesus was arrested and thrown into prison, even though he too was 100% innocent. John 18, 12. The detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus, and they bound him, completely innocent. And he's bound up and thrown and cast among criminals. And we're reminded of the cross. Jesus flanked by criminals, even on the cross. 100% innocent, surrounded by those who weren't. Genesis 40, 15. For indeed I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing here that they should put me into the dungeon. This is now Joseph giving his own 
pleading his own innocence in the whole situation. He's like, man, I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews. I did nothing wrong. And now I'm thrown into this dungeon. What's amazing is that through all of it, Joseph kept his mind and his heart focused on the Lord. Think about some of the things in your own life that have happened to you, that have happened to me, and we look at them and we say, this will now be my permanent excuse to do whatever I want in the kingdom of God. This or that happened to me, I got offended, I got upset, so this is now going to be my ticket out, and I'm going to use this as my catch-all to where any time I don't want to do what God wants me to do, I can always pull this up and say, God, this wasn't fair. I know I've done it. I'm sure many of you have done it. Something happened to you, whether it's in the church or out of the church. You look at that thing and you use this as your great excuse that now you can always use this to just do whatever you want. You know what God says about those things? Forgive. Like a thousand times forgive. Why? Because you and I have been forgiven of everything we've ever done. He says forgive. Move on. Get past it. You know, the great athletes in the world don't get to where they are because that one hurdle that's really hard keeps them down. Imagine seeing an Olympic athlete, he's running around, and he gets to the last hurdle, and he stops, he's like, that one always trips me up, I'm done. Can you imagine that? What would we rather see? Try again. Like, at least jump, dude. You're in the Olympics. Jump, hurl it, trip, fall on your face, get up. Dust yourself off. Keep going. You know what God wants us to do sometimes? I believe with all my heart. Trip and fall and hurt yourself. Fail. But at least try. <clears throat> at least try. Don't come up to that thing that you say, I'll never get over it. And convince yourself that you're right. Listen to the Lord. Let Him work you through it. Yeah, you might fall. It might hurt real bad. And when you get up and you reach out to Him, God... Get me through this. He gets us through it. Jesus spoke out about his own innocence as well. John 18, 22 to 23. When he said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? And Jesus answered him, If I had spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Man, do we do this a lot. Jesus comes right out and just says the truth. He just tells us what's absolutely going on in our life. And we want to turn around and we want to slap him in the face and say, you don't say that to me. You don't tell me what to do. You don't tell me that sex before marriage is wrong, absolutely wrong every time. You don't tell me that, God. You don't tell me that cussing is wrong, absolutely wrong every time I do it. You don't tell me that, God. No, no, no. I'll slap you in your face if you tell me that again. He says, you know what? If I spoke evil, let me hear it. I want to hear your charge, but if not, why are you wanting to strike me? Why are we so quick to want to turn around and tell Jesus how wrong he was if in fact all he's doing is speaking truth in our lives? Genesis 40, 23, yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph but forgot him. Here's what happened. Joseph interpreted his dream for this butler. The butler, he's like, hey man, remember me when you go back upstairs because I'm like, I'm in a dungeon. This is terrible. Like, you're getting out. And the butler's like, gotcha. I got you, bro. And he goes up and it says he forgot. parallel here is Jesus was also forgotten when he healed people, when he forgave sins. We see this in the cleansing of the ten lepers. Luke 17, 12 to 18, he entered a certain village and there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Isn't that where our heart is? When things are going wrong, all of a sudden God is God and He can do anything and then please help me out. Hey, He's Master. He's Jesus. Right? Look at this. So when He saw them, He said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. He gave them a command that says, As they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when He saw that He was healed, He returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on His face at His feet giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this 
foreigner. In your life right now, are you one of the nine, or are you the one? If we have accepted Christ, our Lord and Savior, we have all been cleansed of our sins. We have all taken the death sentence of going to hell, and we have received salvation and forgiveness and cast into the kingdom of God to live with Him forever in heaven. Are we one of the nine? You just keep continuing walking. I'm going to live my life my way. Are you one of the one who comes back and says, Jesus, thank you forever. Thank you for what you did for me. You say, how do I come back? One thing is just being in the church, worshiping with God's people. Super important. Very important. But that's not the end. That's, that's the easiest thing you can do. And I'm glad you're here. Easiest thing you can do. Get up, come to church on Sunday. Easiest thing you can do. Monday through Saturday, there's kingdom work being done from this church around this area into the great outskirts of this great nation. You can be involved with any and all of it. The sad thing is, and the sad truth is, we may very well end up this whole week coming along being exactly as it was last week and the 52,000 weeks before it. You're going to wake up Monday, you're going to know we got Celebrate Recovery Monday night. You can come here. Hurts, habits, hangups. Anybody have those? You come here and you can worship the Lord Jesus Christ and grow. Tuesday nights we've got discipleship, small groups. You can grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Wednesday night, Awana, kids learning to memorize scripture. Thursday nights, if you're a college age person, 18 to 25, wonderful Bible study. If you're a high school kid or a middle school kid, wonderful Bible study. Opportunities to grow in Christ. Friday and Saturday, so there's no church activities. Evangelize. Go out. Tell your neighbors and the world about Jesus Christ. What are you doing? What am I doing? Are you the nine or are you the one? How do you become the one? By coming back to Jesus and just doing what he tells you to do. Came to pass, Genesis 41.1, at the end of the two years, two full years, it says, Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. Joseph is down in the dungeon two additional years. Two more years down there. He was supposed to get out. He was innocent anyway. Somebody forgot about him. He's down in two years. Joseph is in prison for a crime he did not commit. The parallel is Jesus was away from his physical presence of his father while he was going through his most difficult suffering on earth as well. Joseph was 17 when his brothers sold him into slavery. We know that Joseph was 30 about this time when Pharaoh made him the overseer eventually. We know Jesus was 30 when he started his ministry. But what this tells us is Joseph spent 13 years without being reunited with his family. 13 years away from his family and his dad who had this great love for him. Look at Matthew 27:46. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know that Joseph saw the end when he was in the midst of it, too. We'll get to that here in a second. But when you read this about Jesus Christ, and you read that he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a direct quote out of Psalm 22. We looked at it in Sunday school today. Many of you have made it, may have had two. <laughs> psalm 22. If you've never read it, read it. And when you read it, remember Jesus was quoting that whole psalm. Read it to the end. This is a psalm of victory. This is a psalm of resurrection. Jesus was not crying out because, in a sense, he was just felt like he was just abandoned forever. No, because he says, like, one of the next statements, he says, Father, receive my spirit. We know that he knows he wasn't disconnected. He's quoting a psalm saying, look, when it looks like everything's over, when it looks like your life is at the very bottom of the pit and there's no getting out, when you think that it's lost, Jesus can come in and bring life. Genesis 42 eight. Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. The parallel, of course, is that Jesus was also not recognized by his own blood brothers as the Messiah. John 7.5. Even his brothers did not believe in him. <clears throat> Jesus suffered a lot. Joseph shows us pictures of that same type of suffering. Despite all the suffering, Joseph continually received favor for his obedience, and he gained authority 
even in dark places, just as Jesus did. Genesis 39, 2-5. The Lord was with Joseph. He was a successful man. He was in the house of the master, the Egyptian. His master saw the Lord was with him. The Lord made all that he did prosper in his hands. And Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. He made him an overseer of his house. And all that he did, he put under his authority. And so it was from that time, he made him overseer of his house and all that he had. And the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. We go on in that chapter. Even after so he's in the house, he's doing what he's supposed to, and then he gets arrested, right? Look what happens in jail, 3921. The Lord is with Joseph, showed him mercy. He gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Then you go on to chapter 41. Pharaoh said to his servants, right? So Joseph interprets his dream for Pharaoh. And this is what Pharaoh says. Can we find such a one as this? A man in whom is the spirit of God. Pause there. Do you think Joseph had a powerful spirit inside his body? Do you think the Spirit of God working in him did amazing things? Have you put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Surprise, surprise, it's the same Spirit in you. It's the same Spirit in you. The apostles were not amazing because they were apostles. The apostles were amazing because they had the Spirit of the living God in them to do tremendous works in the kingdom. Pharaoh says to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house. All my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. This is Pharaoh of Egypt. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I set you over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took his signet ring, put it off his hand, and put it onto Joseph's hand, clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put a gold chain around his neck. He blinged him up, and he had him ride in the second chariot which he had. And then he cried out before him, Bow the knee. And so he set him over all the land of Egypt. When Jesus was resurrected and ascended on high, the Bible says, All kingdoms, all nations, all tongues, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. Here, a picture in Joseph's life, of him having the same thing. Suffered, concluding point number two, and yet he gained authority everywhere he went. Even though he suffered, he gained authority everywhere he went. Final section here, he was raised. Raised up. We're going to be looking at Genesis 45, but we're going to look here again at 37, verse 3. Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a tunic of many colors. The parallel is that Joseph also had a very exclusive love that he attained from his father. Matthew 3.17 Suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The love that the father had for Jesus is different. It's different. Because Jesus is the father and the father is Jesus. Jesus is God. He has a very special and a very different sort of relationship with God because he is God. Different than what you and I could ever have. He was loved in an exclusive way. We see that by Joseph as well. Chapter 37, verse 28. Then many nights traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. The parallel is that Jesus also was raised from a pit. Matthew 28, 5 to 7. The angel answered, said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you see Jesus who is crucified, for he is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed, he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Jesus was raised from the pit of the grave. Genesis 45, chapter, uh, chapter 45, verse 3. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. Now, I know we're bouncing all over this whole story of Joseph. For those who are familiar with the story, you're kind of tracking, you're keeping along. If you don't know the story, man, go back and read all of it. <coughs> Study it. Ask the Lord. But look, this is what's happened here. 
Pharaoh has a dream. Seven years of famine. Seven years, seven years of good, then seven years of famine. Joseph interprets a dream. Okay, I know how this is going to work. God's going to send seven years of good, and then there's going to be seven years of bad. It's going to wipe out the seven years of good. So you need to save up. So Joseph is telling this to Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, you are amazing. You've got incredible insight. He gives him a signet ring. He builds him up, holds him up, and says, you're going to be over all this. Like You're going to be the administrator to do all this. So Joseph does it all. His brothers come all the way from their land into Egypt because they've heard there's food here. There's stuff here that can help them. They come up and they see Joseph. They don't recognize him. They go through this little exchange back and forth. Finally, Joseph says, look, I'm Joseph. They're standing away. They don't recognize him. He says, I'm Joseph. They're like, but wait, you were dead. We left you for dead. We sold you into slavery. We thought this would be the end. You're supposed to be dead. He says, no, I am Joseph. I am very much. Alive. Jesus' disciples, the parallel is they were dismayed when they saw him resurrected. Luke 24, 36 to 37. As they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. They looked at Jesus and they said, No, you're supposed to be dead. No, this can't be. It's not you. Look at this. Genesis 45, verse, verse 4. Look at the very next verse. Joseph said to his brothers, Okay, come near to me. So they came near. He said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. They're like, come and get a closer look. Look at what Jesus did. Parallel, Jesus offered his disciples to come near. See that it really was him. It was the same one who had been crucified and left for dead. Luke 24, 38, 39. He said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. He says, handle me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Just as Joseph said to his brothers, okay, if you don't believe it, dude, come close. Look at my eyes. Check me out. It's Joseph. Jesus says, when he's resurrected, he says, come here. And then he says this word, handle me. It's like, go ahead, shake my arm, grab my leg, I'm real. I'm super real. He's like, give me some food. Test, I'm real. It's me, guys. Remember, I said I was coming back. Jesus was showing his disciples it was all real. Through the raising of Joseph, the entire world was delivered from death. Genesis 45, verses 5 to 8. This is what Joseph says to his brothers. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you who sent me here but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. The parallel is that all mankind also has been reconciled. Things have been made right to God through Jesus Christ. Joseph and his brothers had a division. They had a great argument. They sold him into slavery, and he comes back and says, no, no, no. We are going to be made right because that is what God has ordained in my life. Do you have someone in your life, a relationship, a family member, a friend, someone in your life that you've looked and you've said, I am cut off from them and I'm just done? Do you know that our God reconciled all mankind to himself through Jesus Christ? And we all sinned against that same God. Who are we to tell anyone <coughs> that we will never forgive them and never be made right with them? 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. All these things are from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Look at that. What's he given us? The ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of making things right. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the whole world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, 
and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Final verse, Colossians 1, 19 and 20. What was Jesus doing? It pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. You have made been made right with God because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. You sinned and I sinned against a righteous and holy God. God went on the cross to take that sin onto himself, to die on that cross, to kill that sin, to kill hell, to kill death for us. And he rose from the grave to be victorious. And anyone who believes in him can have everlasting life with him in heaven. That is what Jesus did for you and Jesus did for me. Have you been reconciled to God? Concluding point number three, he was raised and he attained salvation. Just as Jesus was raised and attained salvation. We see that in the life of Joseph. This whole history series that we're going to be doing is showing that Jesus in his infinite wisdom wrote his story multiple times, multiple ways that we can see it beyond a shadow of a doubt and say, I think that looks like Jesus because he is God over all time, over all creation, and your story, believe it or not, is intended to be part of his story. At this time, we're going to have an invitation. Perhaps God has convicted you of a sin in your life, and you need to come forward and confess, repent against that sin. Maybe you've been looking at somebody in your life or a relationship around you and you have cut it off. And God says, no, you need to reconcile that. Maybe you need to come forward and lay that before the Lord and say, God, I'm sorry. But for those in here who have never put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and you know today, right now, if you die, you have no idea where you're going. Because you've never put your faith in Jesus. So that's you. I'm going to ask you to come forward at the invitation after we pray. And we'll talk about what it means to be saved to be in the kingdom of God and have your sins forgiven forever. If you've been saved and you've never been baptized, you saw that this morning, somebody going completely under the water, completely out declaring to the Lord, God, this is what I believe you did for me and I want to be obedient in it as well. If you've been saved and you've never been baptized, we would love for you to come forward and be obedient to what the Lord has in your heart. Whatever it is God is telling you to do, I want you to do that today. Let's stand up as we get ready to pray for this time of invitation. Stretch those legs out. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. God, the powerful parallels we see here, we didn't even begin to get to all of them. But Lord, you have given us a rich rich text that we can go into and we can know your heart and know your desire for salvation for all mankind. God, thank you for the story of Joseph. Thank you for his faith and his obedience. God, help us to be obedient this morning. Maybe somebody in here knows that they need to take a difficult step. Maybe they're in here and they're wrestling right now with you saying, I know you're telling me to go, but should I go? God, we pray for those where you may very well right now be speaking right to them, telling them to come forward. We pray that you would give them the strength and the burden in their heart to know, yes, you are calling them out. God, let them come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If God is calling you out, you come out. <coughs>
you're a visitor and uh, you didn't get a chance to fill out that card in front of you, that little welcome card, uh, please feel free to take that and, uh, and give that back. We'd love to have a record that you were here and, and follow up with you. Um, I thank the Lord for, uh, for everybody that's been coming uh, Sunday school and, and into the worship service. I pray that God is uh, working in your life and speaking to you. Let's join hands together as we conclude the service today. Stronger, but you are higher than any other. 